Good morning. Welcome to Monrovia. Glad you're with us this morning, whether it's here or online. Glad you can join us. If you've had a wonderful week, the sort that makes you feel like God must be looking out for you, uh, then praise God. If you've had the sort of week that makes you uh, really want to cling to the coffee in your cup, maybe a little bit closer than you might normally cling to Christ, then um, welcome. I'm there with you. Um, I hope we can uh, get our minds focused on worship together this morning. Let's read. This is Psalm 100. Let's read this together as we uh, try to shift gears. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. If you would please stand. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts release the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray, unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. 
No one else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not a now that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide until the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that you've given us a beautiful Lord's Day to come together to sing praises to you, to listen to your word, to pray to you, to fellowship with one another. Father, we thank you for the blessings of this church. Father, I pray for each and every one who's here this morning and those who are uh, listening online. I pray, Father, that we will be united in love, that we will honor and respect one another, and, Father, that we will uh, be an encouragement to one another in every way we can think this morning, Father, about those who are suffering, those who are sick. Um, Jimmy Spain, uh, who suffered a fall and some injuries from that, I pray that you'll be with him. Uh, and others, Father, that we know that, uh, that are hurting, either physically or spiritually, emotionally, those who have lost loved ones. Father, I pray that your comforting hand be upon them, and may we be an encouragement to them as well. Father, we need you. Uh, we thank you for the wonderful things that you've done for us, uh, all the blessings you give to us, especially the blessing of your son, Jesus, who died on the cross, that we might have forgiveness of sins and who was raised from the dead, that we might have hope of everlasting life. Father, we pray that you'll guide us in all the things that we do, uh, defeat us in things that we shouldn't do, and, Father, be a strength to us as we serve you each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we get ready to share communion together. If you didn't have a chance to pick up the emblems on your way in, if you'll raise your hand while we sing this song, we'll make sure those get to you. <coughs> Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need you. God, how I need you. 
Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand up on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my right. Oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. hope everybody's awake. We had to wake up much earlier this morning. I'm going to talk about woke. You all heard, heard that? I'm not going to get real political here, though. But today, people around the world are engaging in cancel culture and embracing woke ideas, right? They believe that the way things were done in the past is foolish, unintelligent, and outdated. With each new generation, traditional beliefs and classical approaches are being challenged in order to introduce fresh, rediscovered, intellectually advanced ideas that may contradict previous long-held truths. So rather than delving in too deeply into to philosophy and politics, let's focus on the reason we're gathered here this moment. We are here to participate in a memorial coming together as a united and faithful body of Christ. This gathering is not only a response to Christ's commandment to remember his sacrifice often, though the sharing or through the sharing of his body and blood, but it is also a celebration of our belief that Jesus was crucified for us. He was raised from the dead, and he has returned to the Father to be our advocate until we are called to our heavenly home. So why do you partic uh, participate in communion so frequently? Why do you use wine and unleavened bread? Why do you ask God, the Father, to bless us as we share in this sacrament? Why do we examine ourselves? considering others as we celebrate this observance? Well, the answer is simple. We do so to reaffirm our seal by the Holy Spirit, our faith, and our eternal want, home, hope, I'm sorry, in the one who has cleansed us and made us righteous. Nothing can take this away. Woke, council culture, nothing can take this away. 
we have it it's sealed in our hearts. Let us praise God through his son. Would you bow with me? Father, as we think about your son, your love, uh, his sacrifice, we think about his body and our body here, that uh, we're joined with you through him. And it's because of his life, because of his death and resurrection, that we celebrate this memorial. Father, help us as we partake of this bread in our remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen. Bow with me again. Father, thank you for this uh, opportunity we have to remember again, even since last week maybe, that uh, it's a special thing that we're gathered here to raise our prayers to you, to think about what we're doing to share in this body and blood as we remember the love that you have for us. Father, thank you so much. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. If you look around, you see a lot of empty seats. I'm not sure how much of that has to do with this being spring break for most of the school systems and how much of it has to do with the fact we moved our clock forward. I'm sure they both have an impact. But uh, I do know we have a lot of people traveling this week and be gone this Sunday and next Sunday. And that's all good. Glad they're enjoying their time. I uh, want to mention a few things. One, you know, typically when we have communion, we talk about giving also, but uh, just in, encourage you certainly uh, to give financially, and you can look in the bulletin at uh, the opportunities there that are presented to us, as well as, uh, you know, missions. We talk about we keep that separate and encourage you to do that. And I want to mention along with that, the closet is coming up, so that's a good time for you to give. Uh, they're taking donations of anything that you have that you could give to that, as well as uh, we mentioned socks and underwear are always a struggle, so if you can buy some or give Brian the money and they can go buy some, that's, that's certainly wonderful. Always look in the bulletin. There's a number of people mentioned there, uh, some with just struggles in this season of life. Others uh, we always need to keep in front of us are those that are shut in, just some not able to get out and... Uh, Encourage them, the families that are providing care for them. That's really important. Uh, Brent, I appreciate in his prayer, he did mention Jimmy. We want to keep him in our prayers. I'm not sure if that made the bulletin. I hadn't looked at it uh, in respect to that. But he fell, uh, had some vertigo, fell, and is in the, uh, I think he's still in the NC, uh, NICU, Neuro Intensive Care Unit. Uh, but uh, Jimmy and Jackie, uh, keep them in your thoughts and prayers as they're going through this and trying to figure out exactly uh, what impact that may have and what treatment he may need moving forward. Uh, again, there's other people mentioned in the bulletin. Encourage and uh, reach out to them. A couple of positive things I want to mention. I told you I stalk you on Facebook. And the only reason I keep Facebook is just so I can stalk the members here and I was able to... Stalk Patrick Golden uh, this week. Was it this week that you retired? That's when I saw the picture. Is that when you retired? Uh, no. Friday was my last day. This Friday will be your last day. No, Friday was your last day. So you have Patrick two days into retirement after 35 years. Tomorrow will be a different morning, right? 
Congratulations. I didn't get this picture in front of you. I saw it a little bit too late for that, but Tim Clements, if you don't know Tim and Carol, wave at everybody. I'll embarrass you in front of everybody. If you don't know Tim and Carol, you need to meet them. They drive up here from Coleman every Sunday just to be a part of our family and engage with us, and that's wonderful. But when was you're retiring, I guess, at the end of the school year, is that right? 40 years in the United States, two years in Germany for a total of 42 years teaching music, right? Give them a hand. That's pretty awesome. I just notice he has less gray than I do, maybe about the same, but can you imagine being in a classroom for 42 years with kids? I don't care what you're teaching. You, yeah, you deserve some kind of a special award for that. But that, that, that's pretty awesome. Congratulations. Uh, March 17th, barbecue is coming up uh, for our men. And opportunity to participate, enjoy that. Uh, love to eat, love to fellowship. Cheers to the golden years. That's coming up April 21st at 5. So uh, if you're, I think it's for 60 and over and, and their, their mates, but... Uh, encourage you to plan to participate in that. Stay for lunch today. We have uh, hamburger steak. Couldn't think of the word. Hamburger steak, gravy, uh, mashed potatoes and gravy. I asked Christy yesterday, I said, do we have two different gravies? She said, no, the same gravy for both of them. So it's, you know, anyway, a brown gravy, which is always good. Green beans, salad, and I love it, dump cake. I didn't know exactly what that was, so I just found a picture of a dump cake for you. All right, stay and eat. It is time for kids to head to class. And as they do that, if you would, please stand. You are holy, you are mighty, you are worthy, worthy of praise. I will follow, I will listen, I will love you. Mighty God, Lord of everything, He's Emmanuel, He's the great I am, He's the Prince of Peace, who is the Lamb, He's the living God, He's my saving grace, He will reign forever, He is ancient of days, He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer, and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. I will follow. And I will live my life for Him. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. He is mighty God, Lord of everything. He's Emmanuel. He's the great I am. He 
He's the Prince of Peace, who is the Lamb. He's the living God, He's my saving grace. He will reign forever, He is ancient of days. He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. Morning again. Say hi. All right, good to see you. Uh, 1025 is awesome because I've got a lot to say today. They were uh, making fun of me. I think it was because they are not making fun, but they, they said when they're putting the slides together, they said, uh, Ray won't preach very long. He's only got seven slides. I said, don't let the number of slides have anything to do with the length of what I've got to say. All right. So I only, I, I was going to come today with no slides, but I thought some of you absolutely need something to look at. So while we're talking in some portions, there'll just be a picture up there. All right. I don't have a lot of writing, but I have a picture for those of you that just need something to look at. Or if you need to go somewhere in your mind, I get that. That's probably what I would do. We are talking about leading up to Easter. We've been doing that. Last week was sort of a, a different kind of message, I guess. I appreciate it. I've got a lot of positive feedback and comments and encouragement. I, I think, thank you so much for that. I want you to know our shepherds. Uh, I would try to mention them all, but I'll forget somebody. But Jim Stanley, Brent Bates, y'all tell me if I forget somebody. I'm looking around. Mike Gunnels. Uh, Jeff Good, Alan Langford, Rick Deal. I get it all? All right. Anyway, they sent me yesterday. It was very encouraging. I went downstairs to work on my lesson, and I had from Jim Stanley. He had sent it, but a letter of affirmation, just their encouragement in what we do in uh, our, our ministry together, and I really appreciate that, guys, and I, I acknowledge that. But I wanted you to know that uh, I didn't want anybody to leave confusing next week thinking any of them had said anything negative to me. They had not, have not, and uh, anyway, if you don't know, if you're sitting here and you think, I don't have any idea what he's talking about, we'll just go back and listen next week. Maybe it'll put it in some context and you'll get it. But we're moving on, all right? And so I mentioned a few weeks ago this point, but I encourage you during this time of the year, I know we started, you know, with like the Catholic Catholic. Uh, liturgical type of, of calendar, you know, the, the spiritual calendar that a lot of people use. And we talked about Ash Wednesday leading into the period of Lent. And I just talked about it because we're le talking leading up to Easter. I encouraged you maybe in your individual life to do three things. One was to set aside some resources and help somebody. Just let God lead you into whatever that looked like. Appetite, denying discipline, in other words, look at something maybe uh, during a day or something over a week or whatever that or during this period of time that you might give up and it would create an appetite within you. And you think, well, I mean, I got, I'm, I'm hungry or whatever that is. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be reminded that I need to go spend some time with God. And then go to inward training. And really, we talked about that's where you go spend that time with God. Whatever that looks like for you, and maybe that would be encouraging. Then a couple of weeks ago, I talked about newness of life, and we sort of been stuck there because, man, that is so hard. And last week, and what I, I said a lot of, and I want to bring this into context, I talked about, and we're not, we're not going deep into this, but there's a lot of different thoughts and beliefs among the entire spiritual, religious, whatever you want to call it, existence, Certainly in the Western culture, even in the Eastern culture, and when I say Eastern, Western, you know, we're, I'm talking worldwide, but in the United States, there's a lot of different thoughts about what happened, not whether Jesus died, buried, and rose, people agree to that, but what that meant, and what impact that had, and how that plays out in people's relationship with God and their view of end times. Eschatology is the word. Eschatology is just the study of end times, what, what that's going to be. And end times, I mean, you know, where are we now and what's next? All that to say, there's a, there's a lot of different thought about that, and I went into that last week, all right? I don't, and I hope you don't. I'm not, you know, used to we had these, uh, like, I'd call them non-negotiables, it's like, I can agree with you on everything, except if you believe this, now this is non-negotiable. Now you and I can't be a part of each other, all right? And there's a lot of things that people had, I mean, went in depth with non-negotiables and what that meant. And my point in that is, 
whatever you believe about that. If you believe in the seven years of tribulation, a thousand year reign, Jesus coming back, go for it. That, if that's what you know, you've studied and that's where you are, that's fine. If you are one of those I mentioned like universalism, if you're one of those that believes God's going to redeem everything and everybody and however that plays out, good. Uh, if you're one of those that's a preterist, and that preterist pretty much means all prophecy's been fulfilled, Jesus died and that started a, a, a process, ended in AD 70. Again, there's a lot more to all these than what I'm saying. Okay, good for that. If you're more of what grew up in traditional churches of Christ or that environment, and you believe that Jesus died, buried, rose, sins washed away, and that there's a second coming, as we would call it, that someday he's coming back and there'll be a judgment. And some will be saved, well, some will be lost. Okay, that's fine. The only thing that is sort of important in this, though, so I say I'm not going to... I'm not going to draw a line and me and you are not going to sit at some table and argue about it, all right? But whichever one of those you believe does have impact on what you believe is right now, okay? And so when we talk, that's sort of where I was last week, I, I just encourage you to consider where I am in my spiritual journey as it relates to life and relationship to God and how that plays out now. That may or may not be where you are, and that's okay. Maybe where you are, you would like to share with me. I know I get to pull, bully pulpit, but maybe sometimes you want to sit and share with me where you are and how that plays out and is encouraging to you. I can be encouraged, and I don't have to be in agreement. Does that make sense? We can have encouraging conversation without having to agree. So, all that being said, sort of... This is where I am and what we see. So we're, we're going to go, we got a lot of ground to cover, and I know we won't get there to the depth that I would love to, but we're going we're gonna to try, all right? So we got to go back, though, and talk about some prophecy and how it relates. Daniel chapter 2, and a, a whole lot of prophecy in end times eschatology comes from the book of Daniel and book of Revelation. There are other places, but those two are very, very significant, all right? And I hope you'll stay with me. Some of you don't like history at all. Some of you like it a little bit and, you know, can, can get into this. But I hope you'll stay with me because there's a few points that I want to make along the way of our discussion that I think are very uh, relational and relative and matter to us, Okay. But Daniel chapter 2 is an interesting story where, as you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. You remember, you know, Israel was supposed to be in the promised land. King not go through all the history, but you know, they, they sort of struggled. They end up splitting into two different kingdoms, you know, the southern and the northern. And the northern ended up taken into captivity by Assyria, right? And then the southern by Babylon. And so this is where we are. We're in Babylon. Babylonian captivity, as we call it. Daniel, you remember, has been called there or, or is there. And that's where we have the story of, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we have the story of Daniel and the lion's den. All this we're very familiar with. What we're not quite as familiar with a lot of times is some of the historical value and a lot of the prophecy that came at that time. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's a king. He has a dream. And in this dream... We'll talk about it in a minute. He sees these things, all right? And when he sees these things, he wants, because they have all these people that are like their, their, uh, their foreseers, their prophets, whatever you want to call them, and they can, you know, the, you have a dream or whatever, they'll interpret it for those that are in power, especially the king. So Nebuchadnezzar has kings. He wants somebody to come and interpret it for him. And all these guys, they're, they're all happy, anxious. They're going to go interpret it for him. But he says, here's the deal. Though I want you to tell me the dream first, and then you tell me the interpretation. That way I will know that you actually have the ability to interpret the, interpret the dream because you will actually know the dream without me telling it to you. Well, they couldn't do it, so he's going to kill a bunch of them. Again, I'm not getting in all the details of the story, but he's going to kill them all because they can't. Well, Daniel rises up. Somebody encourages Daniel. Daniel comes along and God gives him the ability and says, hey, you can go in and interpret this dream. In fact, I need you to do that. I want you to go tell Nebuchadnezzar what this dream is about that he had and then give him the interpretation. Well, the dream is, according to Nebuchadnezzar, he sees this big, tall statue, this big, tall you know, being out there, and it has a head of gold, and it has, you know, like the chest area is silver, then it's girded with bronze, 
And then it has these big feet, legs and feet that are iron, the ten toes of iron. That's what he sees. This is all big and powerful. But this rock comes along, rises up, and it crushes the feet and then the whole being. And it just goes into pieces and the rock becomes this big mountain. All right? That's, that's pretty much the overall view of the dream. And then Daniel gives him the interpretation. The interpretation of the dream. And, and this is one of those prophecies that are pretty good because we don't have to guess a whole lot because he actually goes and tells us you know, a, a lot of what this means. But the deal is, okay, the head of gold, guess what? That's, that's you, Babylon. That's, these are all empires, all right? This is the Babylonian empire. Then the chest of silver, this is the Medes and the Persian empire. And then girded with the bronze, this is the Greek empire that comes along. And then you have the, the feet and legs of uh, iron, this is the Roman empire. And then the rock that rises up, of course, that's the empire, the kingdom that God's going to establish through his son, Jesus Christ, right? This is all the picture, and then there's a story, you know, the story goes on, and Nebuchadnezzar, he ends up having some problems being out, you know, he ends up living out, you know, like an animal for seven years, all this takes place, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot that goes on. In Daniel chapter 1 through chapter 6, and all this that we're reading about, this is just a chronology, it's telling sort of events that happen along the way, then you come to Daniel chapter 7, and things change. All right, now, in Daniel chapter 7, and pretty much through the rest of the book of Daniel, it's not a chronological, like, historical account of things that take place. Now, you start having these prophetic things that are said and take place, and they all go back in historical context and fit within the chronology, most of it, of Daniel 1 through 6. You all with me so far? We good? All right. Good. So, now, Daniel, in chapter 7 of Daniel, he tells us about a dream that he has. It's very interesting. We can't go through all the detail of the dream, but the dream is, is pretty powerful. And it starts with, he sees out in the sea, he sees that it's stirred up by these four different winds. And again, you can get real deep into a lot of things. A lot of this, really the stirring up of the wind. You're near the Mediterranean Sea, so it wouldn't make sense as a Mediterranean Sea, but a lot of People tie the sea actually to the Gentile nations and the four winds or the stirring up of these Gentile nations, whatever, that's all right. But he sees these, but as he's telling about the dream, out of this sea, what rises up are four different beasts, all right? And the first beast that rises up is a lion, all right? And a lion, he sees, rises up out of the... For those of you that need a picture, I got them up there, all right? You'll have to figure out which one we're talking about as we go through. But the lion rises up, and the lion has wings, all right? And as the lion rises up, and it has these wings, and then guess what happens? All of a sudden, the wings are plucked off of the lion, and the lion is raised up to stand like a man, stand on his feet like a man, and it's given the heart or the mind, depending on the translation in the English word that's used, it's given the heart of the mind of a man. And then, in the dream, he sees a second beast that rises up. And the second beast that rises up is a bear. Okay, a bear is a little more powerful, right, than a lion. You know, it's got a little more strength than a lion, but the bear has these three ribs, all right? And the bear is told out of these ribs that are coming out of it to eat of that flesh. To, to just, you know, like you see an a, a animal and they, they come up on something like that. You know, like just to, to, to chow down. By the way, this morning, Brian and Heather's son, Caleb... When he came in, Brian's here early. He's always here early doing a lot of work. Brian does so many things that we don't realize, but he's here early. And Caleb comes in with him. He got a sack, a little four, four piece, a waffle that was cut into four pieces, right? I asked him if he would share one of his waffle pieces with me, and he would not. Absolutely not. I continued to engage him, and guess what he said? My mommy made those for me, not you. <laughs> there you go. So, the bear rose up, had three ribs, and was told to chow down on his meat and 
flesh and I guess not share it with anybody else. It was given to him and to him alone. That was the second beast. Then a third beast rises up and the third beast has four wings. It's a leopard. All right, the third beast is a leopard that rises up out of the sea. All these are rising up out of the sea. And as one rises up and goes away, now the next one comes up again. Now the third leopard, or the third beast rises up. It's a leopard. And the leopard has four wings. Interestingly, that's pretty neat. But it also has four heads. So the leopard with four wings and four heads rises up out of the sea. Now he sees a fourth beast rise up out of the sea. And this beast is really interesting because it's not described like, you know, I get it. I, I can picture a lion, can't you? I can picture a bear. I know what that looks like. And I can picture a leopard. I know what that looks like. But the fourth beast isn't giving any kind of a picture that we can really relate to. It's just like this awful beast, and it gets into details about having horns and ten horns, and then one of the horns comes up and is bigger than the horns and all this stuff. Doesn't really matter, right? It's, it's an ugly beast, especially if you try to picture it. And look, you can sort of see, what, look, at that. where is it? On the right, I guess. Yeah. Before we get to what happens next, you got the four beasts. I want you to get this. Well, first, Daniel is given the interpretation. Guess what the interpretation is? It's exactly like the interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. But it's very different. I want you to see this in just a minute. So the first beast that ro rose up was what? It's a lion, right? With the two wings and it's raised up to stand on his feet and given a heart and mind of a man, that's the Babylonian Empire. In fact, the Babylonian Empire was recognized like that as a lion with wings. That was like, you know, you have a symbol. That was a symbol of the Babylonian Empire. And then the raising up and being like wings could be, or being like a man and given that could be uh, tied very much to Nebuchadnezzar and the issue he had and then him being out, you know, like an animal for a while and then coming back and being restored. So all, all that makes sense and relates to each other. Then the second kingdom you have is the bear that rises up. And the bear is a little more powerful than the lion, but the bear has the three ribs that you know, are, are exposed and told to eat of this flesh. And that's the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians were a little more powerful than the Babylonians, and they were able not to completely wipe them out, but to gain power over them. The three ribs sometimes are compared to like three conquests, and that could be the conquest of uh, Lydia, Egypt, and Babylonia. You know, not exactly sure. There's a lot of thoughts and differences on some of the specifics of the interpretation, but the Medes and the Persian Empire. Then the next one that you have that grows up is the leopard, All right? And what is the leopard compared to the bear and the lion? faster, right? Leopards, they're, they're really fast. And it has the four wings, and then it has the four heads. Well, the leopard would be, what, the Greek empire. And we, we've gone through the Greek empire. You remember talking about it in Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great came into power at a young age. And what is really incredible about the Greek empire and what happened with the Greek empire is over about 10 years, they controlled the entire world at that time. That's just, I mean, it's incredible. The leopard, the speed of the leopard and the ability for the Greek empire to take over all that that area and uh, of the world at that time and the power that they had. Now, Alexander the Great, about 31, 32 years old, when it was tragic how he died, but and in his deathbed, there was no heir to the kingdom. And so he said, let the kingdom go to what? The strongest. And when they tried to figure out that what, what that was, guess what was in the Greek empire with Alexander the Great? There were four kings. Four wings, four heads, there's four kings. The kingdom of the world is that time split up among those four kings. And boy, you get into a lot of history and stuff that takes place with those four kings and the conquest and all of this fighting back and forth. But then the next beast rises up. And the next beast, just like in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, is the Roman Empire that comes along. The Roman Empire. Roman Empire, pretty incredible. Tremendous beast. It lasted for somewhere around a thousand years. If you go back and you look, so like the uh, Babylonian Empire, it was, uh, Babylonian Empire was, it was very much 
controlled by Nebuchadnezzar. Just, you know, that one power. Then you get into like the Medes and the Persians and the Medes and the Persians. It was sort of like a monarchy. The king had power, but it was sort of given by those around it and subjected to it. Then you get into the Greek Empire and the Greek Empire, as you know, it was really autocratic or I'm sorry, aristocratic in a lot of ways because of, you know, like the culture and we get a lot of culture today even from the Greek Empire, but there was power given there among the nobles and the the forward thinkers, the philosophers and all of that. Then you get into the Roman Empire. Roman Empire was very much an imperialistic type of nation. In other words, the You know, the emperor had power, but those around it gave that power and all all this. So these are powerful, but here's here's the point I want you to get out of these two stories. And why don't we go to those? All right, you with me? All right, stay with me. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and if I go back to this and I picture it, that's actually, maybe there's some parts of it you wouldn't agree, but for the most part, that's a pretty picture. I mean, really, you know, you take this statue, if we were to erect a statue with a head of gold and a chest of silver and, you know, the loins girded with the brass, the bronze, and then the legs and the feet of iron. I mean, if you, you know, put that together, built that, it could be a beautiful statue, right? You go to the next picture, though, and you go to what Daniel saw. That's not very pretty at all. These beasts, and you try to picture those rising up out of the sea. There's not a lot of beauty in that. Here's the key as we're moving forward into Easter and to Jesus and to God's kingdom. The picture is the statue that we see first is from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective of these earthly kingdoms. Daniel's view, Daniel's dream is given to him from God's perspective. Get it? We think our earthly kingdoms And I know I preach sometimes probably offensive to you about America. We think there's value in our earthly kingdoms. There can be good things about earthly kingdoms. Earthly kingdoms bring about, just like the Greek Empire again, and the culture it brought about in a lot of ways. There there can be a lot of good within a kingdom that comes forward, but earthly kingdoms are not God's desire. A heavenly kingdom. When I say heavenly the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom. That's God's interest. It's all. It's the only interest. And it's the only thing of beauty to God. Don't ever, ever lose sight of that. This past week we had the chance to listen. I mean, I I don't know if you listen to the State of the Union or not. It's gotten to where in the United States it's almost just, I mean, it's whatever it is. I don't really care, but... Don't get so wrapped up in the state of the union. Get wrapped up in the state of the kingdom. That's what matters. It's where our emphasis and our value should be placed. Now, in Daniel's dream, there's something that happens, and it's pretty incredible. I don't know how many of you looked at Eli. He sent out this picture of art this week and had some discussion I want us to go into this all. So in, in, but we're going to get to the picture here, but I want you to think about this. Daniel, in his dream, then you've got these beasts that have risen up. And now I'm going to tell you, you your, your view of prophecy, you know, the prophetic playing out of what happens here is, that's yours. You have whatever you have about that. But there is one thing that we hopefully can all agree on. In this picture of what Daniel saw in his prophecy, then there is risen up, and I appreciate Brian singing the song. We hadn't coordinated this, but there's a song that we sang right before, and it talks about what the, he is our ancient of days, ancient of days. So in 
Daniel's dream, there is the Ancient of Days. And the Ancient of Days, again, you have to read it to get more of the detail, but the Ancient of Days is on a throne. And the throne has wheels of fire, and there's fire flowing out from it. And around the Ancient of Days, it says there's thousands upon thousands that are serving the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days here and the serving, this could be the angels that are serving. But then it says that there's 10,000 times 10,000 that are paying tribute to the Ancient of Days. That could be the saints, whatever you want to view. But the picture is the Ancient of the Days who is certainly in control, in charge, is on the throne. And all of this is before him. And guess what happens? Before the Ancient of Days is opened up, the book of judgment. The book of judgment is opened up before the ancient of days. We tend to take prophecies like that and statements like that of the end, what we might view as the second coming, and in the second coming that the book will be opened and that we'll all individually stand there and be judged. As I view what Daniel is seeing is what taking place is there's a judgment here of sin that is taking place. There's a judgment of death that is taking place. And the book is open before the Ancient of Days as Daniel is seeing this in his dream. And guess what appears? The Son of Man. Remember, we talked about that when we went over to Matthew. And Jesus asking, who is it people say that I am? Who is the Son of Man? The Son of Man is what's talked about here in Daniel 7, in the dream that Daniel 7, or that Daniel has. And it says that the Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days. And guess what is given to the Son of Man? The Son of Man receives a kingdom that will last forever that will endure forever, and guess what? That is a destructive power to all those kingdoms. The rock in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the rock that came against the toes, the feet, the entire body of all the empires that had stood before, the rock that destroys and is raised up into a mountain. This is what appears before the Ancient of Days and is given a kingdom I personally believe a spiritual kingdom was given to the, uh, to the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. A spiritual kingdom that would endure forever. That you and I have a chance to be a part of. Now, that's Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Here's where I want to go as we move toward our end. When you think... Of that picture, that's a beautiful picture, is it not? It is. It's a beautiful picture of what's taking place before the Ancient of Days. But when you think and you see if we had somebody just to write the factual events from Good Friday, even the week before Good Friday, but from Good Friday through Sunday, it is not pretty. I don't know how many of you saw the movie a few years back, The Passion of the Christ. The Passion of the Christ, I think, was the name of the movie. Probably did the best that's been done in our lifetime, maybe ever, of displaying the ugliness. The ugliness of the betrayal, the trial, and the crucifixion. Nothing about it was pretty. And guess what? In art... For hundreds of years after the crucifixion, it was never portrayed in any kind of beauty. It was not. Because it was not beautiful. Nothing beauty. I mean, look at that picture. As the accused standing before the crowd. What's pretty about that? Nothing. Nothing. I was sharing and talking with Eli before we started. I appreciate what he sends out. The message is in thoughts with art. But understand this about art. A photograph is taken to document the factual representation of what's happening in any particular moment. That's why we have pictures. We have photographs so we can go back and look at the reality of what happened. Your thought and my thought may be different as something that happened 10 years ago, but guess what? If I'm pulling a picture, there you go. Now I see it. 
Art is very different. I could ask you who your favorite artist is, and any number of you might have a, a variety of views, right? But a lot of people would go to Leonardo da Vinci, or some would go to Van Gogh, and I'll just use Van Gogh as a perfect example. And Van Gogh, one of the paintings that Van Gogh painted was called Starry Night. If you're familiar with Starry Night, have you ever seen a picture of it? Maybe some of you have seen it in reality. I think it's in New York right now in the Museum of Art or something. But the Starry Night is a beautiful, beautiful rendition, picture, not a picture, it's art of a sky, all right? And guess what? If you were to go out at night and you were to look up at the sky, you wouldn't probably not see the beauty that is displayed in Van Gogh's picture, The Starry Night, or art, The Starry Night. You get what I'm saying? But that's not the ideal. The ideal in Van Gogh's picture is not for you to think of what you can visually see, it's for you to think what should be in your soul about what is possible out there. Art, not all art, but most art, that's what it's about. It's about taking your mind into your soul, into what is possible. Here's my point. The thought of this picture is not pretty if you think of it in the factual events that are taking place, but maybe it can take your mind and your soul to what's being poured out for you. Here's another picture. In the Greek culture, one of the philosophers, we've talked about, you know, how Alexander the Great was trained with the greatest Aristotle, you know, got to sit at, like, you know, when you did homeschool and you could go in, Aristotle would be the one to teach. That's pretty impressive, right? But uh, Plato, one of the philosophers at that time, came up with, not just him, but what's called the transcendentals. You can look them up. There's three by some, five by others. But Plato really had three transcendentals, three transcendents, three truths, all right? And they were this. Truth, goodness, and beauty. Stay with me. This, this, we're, I'm going to close on this thought. I want you to hear this, all right? Plato, three transcendence. These are true. Truth, goodness, and beauty. Those were taken actually by the early church and early spiritual thought and played out there. And they still are played out in our environments today. Truth, you can relate to what we would call apologetics, all right? I get a little, there, maybe there's a story I'll share with you about apologetics, and there's something called apologetics press. But apologetics, that is the writing, the defending of the facts. Apologetics, did Jesus, was there a man named Jesus that actually lived? What is he actually crucified? Was he raised up? All right, that's apologetics. Those play out in the logos, the truth of life. Then the second is goodness. Goodness is really the ethos, the ethics. All right, the ethics. That is, I, I believe this truth. I believe there was a man, Jesus. I believe he was the son of God. I believe he died, buried, and was raised. I believe he died for the forgiveness and the remission of sins. I believe that. Now, how does that play out in life? What does that look like? What is goodness as it relates to Jesus? And we have spent in the church many, many years trying to define what is good and what is bad, right? Unfortunately, we lose sight of the fact that we're not God. And the fact that we're not God means we really don't understand many times what is good and what is bad. And so the way that plays out with us way too often are in these type of responses. One is this. The church is viewed oftentimes as like having their arms wrapped in disdain as they look at the rest of the world. Right? Right? The other is this, like the clenched fist of protest. We're going to protest all that we believe is evil. Rather than fighting and standing for what might be good, we're going to protest evil. Or even worse is this, the pointing finger 
that you are wrong and I am right. And I'm going to tell you, church, in the market of ideas in the world today that can become attractive and lift up Jesus as the Savior, the Son of God, you assembling in some group believing that you have all truth and looking at the rest of the world with disdain, protesting what you believe is wrong, and pointing fingers to those that you think are not right is not attractive to the world, and it is certainly not attractive to God. It does not work. The third transcendental, though, transcendent, was beauty. And guess what? Beauty... You try to look it up and find a good definition. Beauty, I I love the fact of this. Beauty is that that can't be defined, but when you see it, you know it. Isn't that right? I mean, you just look around and you can see something and you may look over at your wife or your husband or your child or whoever you're with and you, maybe by yourself you're out and you just look and you say, you know what, that's beautiful. But try to define the context of that and you really can't. It's beautiful in form, in structure. It's beautiful in how it plays out in life. But we can't really define it. Barbara McFarland, I hope she won't mind me picking on her. Barbara posted a picture on Facebook. Uh, I don't know, a little over a week ago or something like that. But Barbara posted a picture of art. And in this picture, it had Jesus hanging on the cross, a sort of light you see in front of you now. Jesus hanging on the cross. And it had beside Jesus hanging on the cross, guess what? It had the criminal who was forgiven. And there was some comment about, you know, this criminal forgiven. And it was incredible. You saw an apologetic, you saw a logos, you saw a truth response to that. The truth was, what is going on here? And then the goodness, you saw not the goodness, but the bad of how that's played out. You know, well, this person was only forgiven because they lived before the day of Pentecost after day. You know, there's just all this discussion about that, all right? And all the, the back and forth and some of the ugliness of where we spend way too much of our life and way too much of our energy and way too much of our argument. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes we need to get out of the classroom of trying to figure out what every word in our English word, or our Bible means, and we need to go show beauty to the world. Your time would be much better spent and your soul would be much more enriched and fulfilled. But in that picture, in that art, you saw the discussion back and forth. Why could somebody not just look at that and really look at that and say, how beautiful. How beautiful that God left heaven lived in a human body and human form as we live and hanging there after the very ones he came to save had crucified him and he's hanging there in agony and pain and he is looking at those that were his accusers and his killers and saying father please forgive them and then looking at the thief the criminal on the cross who probably had no reason and no right to be with Jesus the next day and he said today today you and I we're going to take a walk together We're going to chat about my Father's destiny for your life and your soul. Folks, that's beautiful. That's what we're called to be. Quick story and I'm done. I always say that, right? Monday or Tuesday this week, Alan Miller sent me a I think it was Alan where I first got it. A message that said, hey, Ray, you got some boxes out front. All right. Oh, that's sort of weird. Why would I have boxes out front? And then I think yesterday or whatever, Ann Campbell, Ann, who was not here, uh, had said, Ray, the boxes, we put those in my, the boxes are in my office. All right. And there's like four or five boxes, whatever. There are a bunch of them, and they're addressed to you. And, uh, and I sent something to her, and I said, I don't know anything about any boxes. I haven't ordered anything. All right. She replied back and she said, well, that's exciting, isn't it? (laughs) I don't work in that world. So my response back to her was, it's a little scary to me. (laughs) 
I don't know what somebody might be sending me. I got here this morning and I was back in working in the kitchen and Rick Nobles was bringing the boxes around to me. And I told him the same thing. I, said, I hadn't ordered any boxes. I don't know anything about any boxes. Don't know what it might be. I said, before I start trying to take this, let's open one of them up and see what's in it. He said, yeah, that, let's do. And so that was good. I, he went and opened it up. All right. So if somebody was going to die, it's going to be Rick, right? <laughs> Guess what was inside of every one of those packages and boxes? New jeans, underwear, and socks. You know, Brian's mentioned, and I've talked about our need for those specific things. And somebody just responded to that need. I'm not trying to cut down constructive criticism or when I need to be challenged. But not just for Ray Palmer, but for every message you hear about Jesus Christ. How about let that be your response? You know, how about be motivated deep in your heart just to pour some goodness, some beauty into this world? My prayer is that we may all, Ray included, be encouraged to respond to his message that way every time I'm before it. Thank you. If you have kids in class, it is time to go pick them up from their teachers. If you would, please stand as we close. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the glorious name, blessed be your name, with the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name, blessed be your name. On a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, you give and take you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord blessed be your name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord blessed be your name you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, 
Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You are dismissed.